Alan Duster. Here. Laura Scott Holdridge is not here. Matt Roger Lang. Here. Renee Davis. Here. Ken Houston. Here. Wes Lowry. Here. Kevin Bowden. Here. Jason Elkin. Here. 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 Uh, Daniel Cassidy. Here. There we go. Bryce Hadley. Here. Chris Hepper. Here. Um, and Councilmember Martin. Here. And this is uh, Randy Hershoe is the staff member tonight. First of all, Renee, welcome back. Yeah. 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 You missed us all. I know, I'm a happy nerd. Like, I was like, woo! <laughs> well, we're happy to have you back. Excited to be here. Yeah. Okay. Let's start with approval of previous month's minutes. Any comments or questions about the last meeting's minutes from anybody? Uh, a motion to accept them? Absolutely. Okay, motion. Uh, very good. Vote. Yeah, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? I'm abstaining. Okay. okay, how about the water status report? Who, who I'll do that this yeah. morning. All right. All right. All right. All right. Uh, the flow in the St. Rain at Lyons this morning was. Uh, 15 CFS and the historical average is also 15 CFS for the city. Uh, the call on St. Rain uh, this morning was Highland number two, um, and that's a 1881 call. Um, the call on the main stem of the South Platte River was approved for a war with an admin of uh, 26302, and that's a priority date of 1922. Um, Ralph Price Reservoir uh, was at an elevation of uh, 6391.6, approximately uh, 1436 acre feet, which is down approximately, uh, that's 14,000 acre feet, which is down approximately 1,800 acre feet from full. Um, Union Reservoir was at an elevation of 24 feet, or uh, 10,232 acre feet which is down approximately uh, 2,450 acre feet. Um, and currently the uh, St. Ring Basin storage is at 69%. Uh, you know off the top of your head, capacity wise, like rough price, what percent is it of capacity? Is that a number that pops in your head at all? It doesn't pop in my head, but It's a little under 90%. 90? Yeah, because the capacity is 16,197. Okay. We're down about 80 feet. We're down about 80 feet. So a little over, we're probably about 88%. Is that similar to that? Similar in how much it's down? I got union, I'm sorry. It's similar in how much it's down or similar to percentage? Percent. Uh, so the union's at about just under 13,000, and we were at 10. So union percentage wise is, is probably down. Yeah, down to the, so we're, we're pushing 20%. Yeah. 80%. Yeah. Union, and it's because union is just so much louder and shallower and further off so much cheaper. Okay. All right. Let's have a scare. three uh, specific development activities that brought, only one of which is requiring uh, board action. That's the first one, Boston Sunset Apartments final plot. So Boston, uh, Boston Station Apartments final plot. That's uh, roughly a 12 acre parcel. It's down off of, kind of in between Boston Street and First Avenue. It, act, it happens to include two different annexations. So you have the original town annexation and then also the turkey plant addition annexation. So usually when plats come through, they're all part of one annexation. This particular one is two annexations. 
So that which was part of the um, original town annexation because it predated Longmont Water Board, there's no further law on requirements to do on that area. And that which is on the south, which was part of the turkey plant addition, um, when that annexed, there was no historical water rights and there's not been anything satisfied. So therefore, it has three acres of perimeter. So looked at as a whole, um, Boston Station Apartments Final Flat has a 26.01 acre foot deficit, and it would be the clients um, for the satisfaction of that deficit. And so what they're looking to put there is, I think it's around 12 multifamily buildings with about 367 market rate apartments. Do you have any questions on that one? What was the number of them? 367. So just some units are going to have more of 40 or more, and others less than 40, but about 40 per, per building. And I assume they're doing cash and move. Uh, so there, I think so. There might be, there were, they're entertaining the idea of trying to find some on the store. So that's good. There, this particular one might not be satisfied until later this year, but the group that is um, developing this develops all over the country, and we specialize in apartments. And so, if they can find some non-historic water, and hold it until they're ready to satisfy everything. They will, but um, they haven't decided for sure how they're going to satisfy. You know, just for my information. Talk about direct flow requirement and um, storage requirement. We always kind of get that combination between the two in these developments, or some just swing to one or the other. So, I think I understand your question. So, um, typically, um, a development when it comes through is annexation, when they bring their historic water. It'll typically satisfy a majority of the direct flow component, that being the two acre foot per acre, and sometimes a little bit of the storage. In this one, in this case, it's you kind of got the opposite end of both spectrum. You got one part of this that has no uh, no further deficits, and the other one's got three acre feet per acre. Where let's just say a typical plat would normally have one or one and a half acre foot per acre over the entire plat. So this hybrid here, it's, it's um, but, so if your question is, what do they normally bring in the store? It usually it satisfies a significant portion of the direct flow, maybe a minority portion of the storage, but with each annexation being unique, it's it's all over the board. From not, having none, to even having some fully satisfied. We've had some annexation, that it brought their historic water and when applied it satisfied the full three acre foot per acre. So really all the way across the board. Any other questions about this proposal? Yeah. Uh, Is it really logs behind you? The little, those are little gravel pits on the south? So say that again. Is there a little gravel pits on the south? I'm just curious to what is the, the south. So the <laughs> This is a part of the uh, Dickens Farm part, it's not south of Boston Avenue is on the way. See, okay. Do you have any storm water concerns with that? I mean, I assume that's in that page. It's not a lot of parking spaces for that many people. Mm -hmm. Is that going to run out during the drainage? I, I would be surprised if there's storm damage. Chris, do you have any idea? Yes. Um, so I'm Chris Upper with uh, Public Works. Um, so there, there are drainage issues with this site, uh, mostly due to the fact that there are sanitary sewer trunk lanes that run east west on the north side of Boston Avenue, um, which is interfering with their ability to get stormwater from off their site. And the site typically flows from north to south. Um, and today it's all flowing over. Um, as we try to get in the ponds and water quality features, those sorts of things, and having to dig down, they're running into those intersectors. The intersectors are about four feet deep, and one of them is one of them is 36 inch, and we've got a 30 inch pipe. Um, 
So they're significant projects to get around. So they're working on uh, proposals for the bridge. And stuff like that. So does the city not have as built maps for that <laughs> surface infrastructure? Almost there. So they knew that it was there? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Staff have been working with them for quite some time on that. Okay. <coughs> So one option that they are looking into is to try to get into that pond, but um, there's there are several issues with that. Um, and we'll get into part of that not through the case, but uh, one option is also to go directly east uh, where the three main fire training centers are just pretty much. So, so there are that way at this point. Any other comments? I was yeah. just gonna say it didn't seem like there was any like affordable housing no more than what's going to be standard requirement yeah that i guess so th th that wasn't included in the rundown either. right yeah. we, we've not usually we'd only included if they're looking for an exceptional uh above and beyond a minimum so yeah so therefore this isn't like what we've seen when we did the one by the cost like cost right yeah. this isn't the same kind of thing and that was because they went a, well for one I'm, so there was a city, um, an economic development incentive, oh, yeah. and then there was also the affordable housing incentive. This, what they're proposing here, doesn't trigger that. They yeah. haven't got to that level. And so that was our last, maybe my last experience with some of this. And so, but that's that's not necessarily typical. We're back to kind of like your running mill. That's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's that right now we're at the economic of land prices and building materials, a lot of, of uh, projects that have been planning to build affordable units are paying fees and fees because they can't move the price on the market rates. Yeah. So we're actually losing the expectation of, of builders providing affordable units on that. Yeah. You know, to that point, Marsh, are, are, are they given the option to supply money? To build affordable on another site, is that an option you give them? Um, they can pay the fee in lieu, which goes into the affordable housing fund. They can donate land. They can build affordable units on another site that is less costly. Although I don't know if we've ever had anybody do that, um, but the fee in lieu is essentially that to pay money. And do we tend to? them one way or the other or is it their option it was intended to be their option but it has not been rebalanced in a while it should have been rebalanced after three years and we're in the middle of a pandemic so i don't i i can forget but i don't think we did that okay. um uh, we were also you know karen rooney was leaving molly was coming on yeah. um so i think that would probably come up this summer the budgeting cycle begins. I hope. Okay, is there a motion on this project? I can't. So, because it's so at this stage, we just what is our obligation? Oh, right. 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 recommendation to City Council on that this is the <clears throat> that these are the deficits. And you concur with what the just the calculus of it all yeah so yeah i i all right. move all right second so, yeah okay awesome so the other two that were in front of we, you we got to vote oh on. sorry yeah yeah, that's, yeah that's approved of that. <laughs> all, all in favor so the other two in front of you are for information that Domi Town Homes Final Subdivision Lab. Um, <clears throat> the reason this one is for information, it's already in compliance, so there's really nothing further for you to act on. But it is a uh, roughly an eight acre parcel um, located south of Kimpratt Boulevard. Um, this one's for uh, 96 townhomes in the mixed use area, and um, I think there's like 16 rows of townhomes in this one, um, but it's in compliance. So um, that's why that one doesn't need your, your action. 
The other one that we have is springs at Longmont Final Flat. And the reason this one isn't running either is it's changing the acreage, the requirement acreage, therefore changed. So it's been updated to reflect that. But it was for 10 buildings and a total of 212 multifamily units. And so again, just doing that, confirm just to correct that. Uh, that's that's some changing in area. Is that gonna fill up most of that vacant area? That's the it's just west of Walmart, isn't it? And just south of Walmart, that's right. Yeah. There's or south of Walmart, I know. Yeah. So there's, yeah, this isn't the, this isn't what we'll call, some people would refer to kind of a place to bury it out there. This is, if you exercised out, if you, if you left Walmart, there's already some houses or some condo units that are there. This is on the, behind those, you really wouldn't. I don't, know what that's, I don't know what that street is if it runs south of Walmart, but mm -hmm. it's, not, it's south of that street then. Right? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Well, uh, no. I think it's maybe right. I think it might be the street. The little street is. Is it Slayton Drive? Or Slayton? I, it's whatever it is. Slayton Road, Mr. It doesn't show there. Yeah. Yeah, it's Slayton. It's up on the top. Anyway, so. So that was just for informational purposes. Okay. Any other comments? Go ahead. also was the posting place? Yes, so each year um, we're required to designate a specific location where the public can go and find board meeting notices. And since we didn't have a meeting in January, we're doing that now. And so the city attorney's office has recommended that we designate the public portal on the city's web page and website as the primary location of its official posting place for monthly board meetings. The St. Green, or St. the service center lobby as the backup location. And so that would be staff's recommendation. And that's what it was last year, and we're recommending this place to move with that. So, but we needed an affirmative action to really establish the place in place. Questions for Lawrence? Okay. I'd like to make a motion to accept staff's recommendation. Sure, I'd like a, a motion to approve the um, suggested public posting places. Second. Okay. So, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 This, so that will be, that's just on this photo. I mean, that's right. Don't see this coming back again. It'll, it'll come back next January. So really? Annually? Annually, we have to do this. Okay. Uh, Danielle, you down there? I'm here. Uh, I guess, I, let me ask a question to the board members. Was everybody able to access these sites to, to look at management plan? Yes, it took me a while to figure out that it was in my junk folder, but oh. <laughs> which it said, it said very clearly, it's yes. in your junk folder. And I'm like, oh, okay, the access portal thing. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay. Everybody get through it? My, uh, my junk card was in packet, so yeah. it was like in my room. Okay, well, it, it's pretty voluminous, um, yeah, as you know, Danielle. How, how do you want to go about uh, well, educating us on what this I is all wanna, about. Well, so what I think we have is everybody's had a chance to look at the document, but people have been on water board for various lengths of time and so have had various exposure to this project. That is why I put together this PowerPoint, which I'll go through rather quickly, okay. keeping in mind that I'm talking to people who may know a lot of this already. I picked up a lot of this in the document, but I kind of want to set the scene for people who haven't been sitting here since 2019 when this project kicked off because um, I presented this at uh, Parks and Rec Advisory Board and it was the same situation. Some people that were brand new to the board didn't have the, the context that some other people had. So okay. I acknowledge that there are a lot of slides. There are 40 slides, but I divided it up. I'll go through it quickly. 
Um, and then we can talk about it and you can ask your questions. That's okay. that's how I'd like to handle it. That's Is great. there a remote or something I can flip through my slides? Can I, can I bring that down again? Yep. Not gonna ask. <laughs> <laughs> Is that chimney hollow asphalt you've got here? It is, yeah. <laughs> Send Lots of slides. These these numbers are a little off because I keep fussing with this presentation. But 40 slides, and I I try to divide it logically out into the way that the document was presented to you. Why did we do this plan? How did we develop this plan? What methods went into collecting the data? Because there was scientific data, visitor use data, and and public engagement. And then then we'll talk about some results, and then we'll talk about what what we recommend. Um, okay. So first, where is Button Rock? This group knows where Button Rock is. Here it is. It's in the foothills west of Lyons. Here's the city of Longmont. Uh, this is the map that you see currently in the kiosk when you go to Button Rock, and it gives you a good sense of the, the preserved boundary there is the white, but then you see that a lot of the surrounding land is other public land. A lot of it is forest service. In the south and southeast, you see some Boulder County land, and then you've got some private land, some residences that access their properties through the gate. Uh, Button Rock is the only preserve that Longmont has in its system. We have open spaces, natural areas, parks, but this is the only Preserve 2,671 acres uh, managed for water storage and the ecology of the surrounding acreage. Throughout this, this has been a four year process, and one thing, one important piece is that we developed a purpose statement for Button Rock Preserve, which we hope to codify in code as this uh, document process is accepted. Um, this is the only slide I actually do want to read to you, so here we go. To protect, preserve, restore, and sustain Button Rock Preserve's municipal drinking water storage and supply, native ecosystems, wildlife habitat, and cultural resources in perpetuity. To support preserve management and enhance the ecological function of Button Rock Preserve's natural systems, as well as the Greater St. Grain Creek watershed in which it presides and to prescribe areas suitable for passive use in addition to areas closed for resource protection, facility protection, or public safety. So keep that in mind as we go through the rest because it, it um, informs everything else in the, in the document and the presentation. Um, there are a lot of guiding documents that went into this plan, including Vision Longmont, including City Council's work plan, including City Council's 2019 climate emergency, uh, the, the 2018 open space plan, the 2019 wildlife management plan. All, all of those uh, were resources that um, underpin the, 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 the forestry uh, stewardship plan for Button Rock. They all underpin this plan even though this is uh, the first management plan that we have for Button Rock. And this slide is important because it's reminding you that um, climate change is the driver of biodiversity and biodiversity is one of the solutions to climate change. So why, why are we doing this plan now? Again, these are questions to keep in mind as we go through the rest of the presentation. How did we develop this plan? We worked with a lot of different agencies. We had a technical advisory uh, committee, so it wasn't just staff working on this alone. We worked with Parks and Wildlife, State Forest Service, U.S. Forest Service, um, Boulder County, Left Hand Watershed Center, Lions, the town of Lions, and then we had various consultants helping us on the data collection as well. Uh, the public was very involved throughout this process. We have 
had and have uh, a website called Caring for Button Rock where the public could go if they missed a public meeting and see what happened and read other people's comments, make their own comments. And then we've come and updated three boards throughout this process, the Water Board, the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, and the Sustainability Board. And what, when we are done, that will be five visits to each board and eight visits to City Council with interim updates and then our final presentation. This is just a little bit of the timeline. Like many projects of the city, we got a little waylaid by the pandemic. So normally we don't take this long on a management plan, but here we are. Okay, so some of the methods that went into this plan. So we developed goals in the document. You'll see 10 goals here. You'll see three, uh, three of the most critical goals and you'll see this upside down triangle. Um, the, the, the purpose of Button Rock is to protect the water quality, the, the delivery storage and infrastructure but also conserve the biodiversity of the greater preserve. And then also a promise to our residents to keep it open for passive recreation, as long as goals one and two are not adversely affected. So this is just a, a kind of a visual for that. Um, scientific data collection, botany and zoology was done in these categories here, hydrology was done in these categories here. Um, other baseline data, scientific data collected, roads and trails, so mapping, uh, science inventory was completed, cultural resource uh, documentation was done, and infrastructure was looked at throughout the preserve. And then we looked at visitor use, um, the visitation rules, um, rules haven't been significantly updated at our preserve since the 1990s, but things have changed a lot at the preserve since the 1990s, so we took a look at that. Um, staffing, and then impacts of the different types of recreation that are allowed at Button Rock. Uh, another type of method that we used on this project was literature, literature review. This is an excerpt of the literature that we reviewed um, specifically on domestic dogs, domestic dogs in nature areas. Okay, and then part four, so now we're getting into results. And first I'm gonna talk about the results we found in the visitor use category. And then I'm gonna get into, we engage the public. What, what did we learn from the public engagement and what were some of the comments and, um, so first of all, here's a timeline I made for, for people who haven't been here this whole time, uh, with this four years that this has been going on. So in the 80s and 90s, we, the city of Longmont developed a formal trail system because we were starting to see higher recreational use at Button Rock, and so it, formalizing the trails. And then in the early 1990s, the way we, the way we handled allowing passive recreation at the preserve is over time we slowly added more uses. So for example, rock climbing came in and then maybe fishing and then and then maybe dog walking was allowed. So it wasn't it wasn't we opened in 1965 and everything happened all at the same time. It was kind of a an iterative thing that came about. And then in 2011 we saw a kind of a jump in visitor numbers, and we'll look at that in a future slide. Uh, the flood happened in 2013, and these are the words of our former watershed ranger at Button Rock, Jamie Friel, social media advertising the preserve. Um, that, that just, it was something significant that, that he noticed, that although it's not advertised everywhere, everybody was learning about the preserve because of social media. Uh, in 2018, oh, the, the staff, the staff came to Water Board and Council and proposed changes to the domestic dog policy at Button Rock Preserve. At the time, nothing was changed, but then in, with, with, with what, was, what was being proposed in terms of dog leashing. Um, but then in 2019, you know, that was a bit of a catalyst to this management plan 
process being kicked off. And when, it, when we kicked it off and introduced it to council, city council then put in place the interim dog visitation policy that we currently have, which is if you visit Button Rock with a dog, you have to have one, it's one dog per person on a leash with the dog pickup bag. And that's what's been in place since 2019. First with educational enforcement for a time after, and then after that, just straight ranger enforcement. Um, and now here we are in 2023, or down there at the second to the bottom, presenting, presenting the draft plan to the boards. And then um, next month, we'll be presenting it to city council. So you are the third of three boards. So now back to some of the visitor use results. Um, this is what you see in the left box there is a, a mixture of what we found from the public survey. So we, we, we surveyed demographics each time we surveyed. Three out of four surveys, we looked at demographics and we found that roughly 65 to 74% of the people that visit the preserve are, are from along lots of code. And then here on the right, you see visitor numbers over time. And these are all ranger qualitative estimates of visitors until you get to 2018. Then we started using automated counters and that's when we also started uh, taking data in on cars as well. So cars suddenly show up there in 2018. 2022, something went wrong with our counters, so we don't have good full year data for that, so it's not shown here. Um, and then the upper left is just a graphic of what that looks like. The cars are there in orange. Okay, so now we're getting into public engagement. Some of the results of our surveys. So in this first survey, there are four surveys, 426 people participated, 45% of people bring a dog. Most people come to the preserve to hike, and most people visit multiple times per year. In survey two, 67% bring one to two people. This, so 983 people responded to this survey. 60% would still visit the preserve if there were a fee. 70% understand that it is Longmont's primary source of drinking water. 82% agree that prescribed fire is an important management tool. And 81% prefer to encounter fewer than 25 people. And then in the comments, the majority of comments were saying, if, if, if we were to add amenities, what, what do you want? And people were saying restrooms and trash or trash cans. Survey three, 831 participants. Most people disagreed with eliminating the fishing permit, something considered during this planning process. And then if there were a fee charged, most people support a weekend daily vehicle pass. And most people agree with a fee during the busy summer months. Uh, this is the same survey here. Uh, we, we saw 131 written comments, and those listed there in the middle are the categories that the comments are in. Most comments were about dogs and hiking and fees. Um, and most people would not ride a shuttle, but this survey was conducted at the very beginning of the COVID pandemic in April and May. So if, if we were going to think about that further or collect more data, we may want to um, redo that survey just because of the timing that that was done. Um, and most people surveyed here agree, uh, disagree with the no dog recommendation from staff. Uh, public survey number four focused on code updates to the Button Rock Code. So the, the purpose that we read at the beginning, we, we were recommending that we codify that in the code because there's nothing written about the purpose of the preserve in the code. And then these are some of the other recommendations. Um, and, and what you're reading here is that of all the recommendations made, the, the public felt fine about all of them except the dog recommendation. In general, or the majority of people said they agree, disagree with a prohibition on dogs. And now into the scientific results. So the botany and zoology, and I'm not going to get into all this detail, but the point of this slide is that what we have is an incredibly diverse preserve in terms of native plants, rare plants, uh, native wildlife, and um, across many categories, amphibians, bats and other mammals, um, 
even insects, which were observed but not, you know, um, <coughs> quantitated in this, it wasn't part of the baseline data, but. Um, so the botany and zoology showed us just what an incredible preserve you have in terms of biodiversity. And now looking into the literature and from what we know as professionals in the field, dogs in a preserve, in a protected preserve, do have an immediate impact on ecosystems and wildlife. And these are some of the impacts that dogs have. Uh, one particular study that was done in Hall Ranch, which is adjacent to Button Rock, is something that we highlighted here because it was interesting. It, it, it shows the effect of dogs, whether they're on or off leash, and the effect that they have when a person and a dog on or off leash are on a trail on these different species. And these are local species. All these species that were looked at in Hall Ranch also exist in Button Rock Preserve. So you can just see the area of influence with dogs are the dotted lines is greater. If a person is walking up that trail and there are mule deer nearby, then their travel path is going to be changed. Can I ask you a quick question? Did you say all these dog comments, are these dogs leashed or unleashed? I mean, they looked at both dogs on and off leash, and this is, this is com a combined result. Okay. So this is not Button Rock then? This is at Hall Ranch. This okay. is a study that was done at Hall Ranch in 2008. Um, we worked with river restoration consultants and they collected hydrology data for us. So they went and they looked and they mapped out all the drainage basins at Button Rock Preserve. So all those drainage basins you know, draining into the North St. Frame Creek and the Ralph Price Reservoir and the Longmont Reservoir that we have there in the middle of our preserve. So this graphic just kind of shows you that um, it's all connected. Danielle, on that previous slide, was that in meters or miles? No, I don't know that. Meters. You're, you're talking about the dog? Meters. You know, and if you, like, when I put slide numbers on here, so we can go back to things. So you're looking at impact on either side of a trail. So, like, mule deer are really affected. 100 meter, meters on either side of the trail. Uh, dogs also have leave waste behind, and some of it gets picked up, and some of it gets half picked up, and some of it doesn't get picked up. And that has an immediate impact on the water and the soil and the biodiversity of the preserve. Here are some of the impacts. Recommendations. These are recommendations from staff after all this data has been collected and um, you know, in conjunction with our technical advisory committee of all of those agencies that we worked with to put this plan together. Colorado Parks and Wildlife, Boulder County, Town of Lions, etc. So we do recommend implementing a no dog policy at Button Rock Preserve, because like I said, it's our only preserve. And while this data doesn't necessarily show, okay, we can point to an acute problem and I can give you that this equals this. We know that we have significant diversity in our preserve. We know we have incredible resources that we're trying to protect. So, you know, doing nothing staff feels is not, is not a good way forward given present day circumstances and um, with visitor use the way it is today. Also on this slide is um, just some data from the last couple of years in terms of um, ranger contacts at the preserve. The most um, significant amount of contacts happened for dog violations. Dogs off leash, more than one dog. In 20, 
21, 210 ranger contacts for dog violations and 151 in 2022. Also, good neighbor, not something I've talked about yet, but um, we are adjacent to Boulder County and they, um, they at Hall Ranch designed their trails. So the trail that, that is connected to Button Rock Preserve that goes back and forth, they do not allow um, bikes on that trail. They do allow bikes in Hall Ranch, but not on that trail because we don't have bikes in the preserve. So they did us, they did us that, um, they worked with us on that planning effort to make sure that that worked for us. And but since we allow dogs, we do, uh, we do sometimes have dogs going into Hall Ranch. So they've, in the intervening years, put up signs at the various Forest border places to, to say, you know, you're, you're entering Hall Ranch, there's a dog prohibition here. Um, some, something that we heard, um, something that I have heard is that there aren't a lot of other places to take your dog. Um, and so this, this is just some of the other places that you can take your dog. If you remember in the beginning, we're surrounded by U.S. Forest Service land at the preserve and um, U.S. Forest Service allows dogs in most places. And then, you know, City of Longmont has lots of places. We have another two, th we've got our 2,600 acre preserve, but we've got another 2,400 acres of parks and open spaces and natural areas where dogs are allowed. And we've got six dog parks allowed. But don't feed our grizzly dogs. Yeah. And another, recommendation that is coming out of this plan is um, dividing the preserve into management zones. Now that we have all this really important uh, bot botany and zoology data, it, it, it's kind of clear how the preserve could be divided into management zones. So you can see up here in the upper left with the, the checkered, um, that would be uh, a seasonal closure for elk, but you know, the rest of the year when it's not seasonally closed for elk, it would be part of zone three, natural areas. This is a habitat conservation area where there are quite a few important resources. And so keeping this area closed for biodiversity protection is a recommendation. So management zones. And then a lot of management actions came out of this plan, as you saw, as you got to the end there, some of those tables at the end of the document. And then we recommended a um, level of importance and a timeline for these. So short-term, mid-term, long-term, or something that could be ongoing. And then they're divided into the categories you saw in the plan. Um, so for example, we, we do have uh, water sampling points that are going on up there. We want to continue to collect that data. Um, it's going to be more useful in the midterm, which is, you know, five years plus as we get more years of data in a row. This is a very important um, piece of data that we want to continue to collect and work with the um, water quality lab on, Long Months Water Quality Lab. Other, oh. Can we go back? Yeah, um, item one, planning to add raw, raw water supply. Do you, do you know more specific? What, what are the thoughts about that? So do you recall in the document, we showed a figure of just the research that has been done on the expansion of uh, Ralph Price Reservoir in the future? It's something that's off in the distant future, but we did look at what it would look like, what would the footprint look like, and so now we can see it. We can see it in terms of, uh, you know, where we've put our management zones and where that would be in terms of existing infrastructure, trails, and things like that. And kind of we can so say it's more. an expansion. It would be an expansion, yeah. It, it would button. It would allow Button Rock Preserve to be a place where we could have increased capacity okay. for storage, water storage. Almost done. These are just the other categories that um, we put things in terms of a timeline and priority list. And code updates. Um, 
we want the button rock section of code to stand on its own. We want people to be able to go there and understand all the rules and regulations of uh, that apply to button rock. And we want them to be updated to align with the present day uses that we're seeing at button rock. And here in the corner, I've started to populate this box with the results that we're seeing from our three boards. So Parks and Rec Advisory Board voted five to one to accept this plan and to recommend it to council, but they also acknowledge that they are split on the issue of the dog recommendation. Sustainability Board voted five to one to accept the plan and recommend it to council. And um, this is the end. Yeah, I've got a, this dog thing seems to be pretty controversial. Boulder County allow dogs in any of their areas? Or they they, they allow dogs in most of their areas. Actually, they don't allow dogs at, I believe it's called Dog Lake, Caribou Ranch, um, Hall and Heil Ranch. So in 2006, after doing seven years of work and study, they um, proposed and then adopted a, a, a dog moratorium at Hall and Heil Ranch. And so those are the four places that just no dogs are allowed. Leash dogs are allowed at some places. Hall, um, sorry, not Hall, but some places are split where you have to have dogs can be on certain trails, dogs can be on leash on certain trails. I don't, I don't really know all the details. I really know where they have a dog moratorium. And the Forest Service, what's there? The Forest Service and BLM are kind of in one category in terms of how they, their philosophy in terms of recreation and where dogs can be. And then I would say National Park Service and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service are in a different category. Those are in a conservation versus a recreation focus. So if you're going to go to Rocky Mountain National Park, dogs are allowed in kind of very developed areas, parking lots, where people are, their cars, and things like that. And that's, that's about it. They don't want dogs out on the alpine tundra and things like that. But Forest Service, almost every single trail, dogs are allowed. You know, and, and recreation is the focus. Martin? Yeah, um, I'm wondering in the places where dogs are allowed versus not allowed outside but not, um, do those, do their rules take into account the contribution to the watershed? I am not sure I'm able to answer that one. Maybe because that's, I mean, I think it depends, right? It depends on the organization and which place you're talking about and if it's part of a watershed. I mean, yeah, it, it's some, some watersheds, like Boulder's watershed, mm -hmm. no dogs. It's mm -hmm. the watershed. So Boulder, Boulder takes that into account. We're not sure about the forest service and stuff. Yeah. I would just point out, too, that the Silver Lake drainage uh, managed by the city of Boulder, it's not just no dogs, it's, it's no people. No recreation, no public access at all. Mm -hmm. If you're thinking about the area beyond the Rainbow Lakes Trailhead. Um, so, as Danielle pointed out, there's a spectrum of, of how watershed protection is approached by land management agencies. Again, Danielle pointed out the conservation ethic of the National Park Service. They don't allow dogs at all. You have the kind of on that end, no public access at all in Silver Lake drainage um, to, you know, kind of everywhere in between. The, National, the USDA Forest Service generally allowing dogs, generally allowing dogs off leash. However, they also have wilderness areas where dogs are required generally to be on leash. Uh, and they sometimes have buffers for camping and things like that around lakes in their wilderness areas and recreation areas. So there's a spectrum across the country in terms of how these resources are, are managed. Well, I mean, I'm just looking at the plan, and, and I kind of, one of my most of the comments, I guess, to the end is, I really like that you're prioritizing in the plan that it is a water resources preserve, not a recreation facility. Um, I think that that's something that gets lost. A lot of people are like, hey, I'm going to go recreate, and it's like, cool, but that's not the primary purpose here. So thank you for prioritizing that. I think that's huge, um, because I think it contextualizes what we're asking for when we do ask for, you know, dog limitations or no dogs or, 
um, you know, it's, it's pretty basic, but it ties it in. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I was also kind of interested to see that the visitor counts are just up. Like they were nuts in 2020, but so is everything else. But they've been, you know, half nuts, like for five or 10 years now. There, there was a root and then a step up in the spike in 2020. But it's, and it hasn't really gone down. Like it looked like it went down, but it went down to the original thing that kind of got everybody nervous. Um, and I think that's important too. In your recommendations, did you include a recommendation to uh, charge? So we surveyed the public about that. I was delighted to see there was public support for it during high, high times. I was like, that's great. But we didn't make a recommendation at this time because we feel that we want to further study that. We, we, we guide Dan, and you can go into the appendices and really see the, the question we specifically asked. Because we really dug in and said, like, if it's a pass, what kind of pass? Yeah. You know, on, on what days? And um, we presented that here. But it's not something that we're ready to recommend at this time. Um, we, we think with management zones, a dog prohibition, and the code updates, and the, you know, codifying the purpose, and the rest of the code updates for present day, that um, these will be really effective tools. But we also acknowledge that this is a um, an adaptive plan, right? Um, and it's just based on today's best science. And so if, if more science comes in, and as we continue to do the studies that we're recommending, the further studies, the more pointed studies, we want to we want to go in and be able to update the plan. I, I I'm going to harp on the fees just a little longer because I I actually was really keen to see public support for it, and I also know that if we're spending staff time by we I'm going to talk about people in Longmont who are paying utility bills, and you know that sort of thing. That's supporting staff time to deal with public, and when people outside the community come in and also create a need for that staff time. I'm very comfortable asking them to help pay for it. Um, you know, it's kind of one of those things of, of pay for what you use. Um, and so, I still think it's a good tool. Um, I did like, you know, the, there was an element in the plan where it was, you know, if you have a utility bill, you get one rate. And if you can't provide a utility bill, you get a higher rate. And that's kind of one of those things I was, I was kind of digging that too. Yeah. Um, and to your point, which uh, is definitely insightful, I appreciate you looking at this plan. Um, one of the policies that we surveyed the public about was rescinding the rail price fishing permit. Ultimately, the public disagreed with rescinding that, but it's something that we researched. That is a, a, a fee that we do have in place for fishing on rail price during a, a specified season. And we have two fee rates for utility and non-utility customers so I just wanted to speak to that so that's already in place well yes specifically for just for fishing use. yeah correct yeah okay. it has been for some time so that's that's kind of awesome because it's like you're trying it out and, and i guess part of the reason i also see fee is i could see fee reducing people counts because you know dogs are an issue in terms of dog waste dogs are an issue in terms of wildlife interaction but to be honest with you people are an issue too I mean, there's, there's waste of various sorts of people. And then, of course, my fear from a water resources perspective is fire. Um, and, you know, I know there's no camping, there's no open fires up there. But, you know, people can't follow the dog rule. I, it, just fewer people, fewer fires is kind of well, I mean, I've looked at a lot of pictures and I ran into people, people's fire pits and things like that. You know? And that's scary, man. That, I mean, that's scary. The effect of fire on a watershed is just... Alan, do you have a comment? Uh, I, um, first of all, I'll, I'll reiterate a few of the things that Renee said. I mean, I think, um, I think the, the, the dog recommendation seems to make a lot of sense, um, specifically because you so nicely outlined the hierarchy of priority uh, for the space, right? So that it is a, a water preserve first, a biodiversity preserve second, a recreational opportunity is somewhere on the list as well, but but that uh, yeah, but we really need to kind of like prioritize those first few things above and beyond everything else, and it makes a lot of sense to me to that that you know dogs are not necessarily the the best situation for the, the prioritizers for people. So 
Um, I just want, I had a question about the, the, um, the, the fishing. Um, so the, the issue here is whether or not to risk Rescind the special permit Correct. for for fish, fishing there. So a state, you you have you have to carry the state license with you no matter what. So, so and it's not the issue of like whether to not like a prohibition on fishing. Or something. No, the, yeah. the the question that was asked to the public was, you know, because we were we were seeing, especially with our our, our former watershed ranger, it was. It was selling the permits and um, working on the working on the permits, you know. And um, if the permits, if we offered six hundred permits and they weren't selling out every year, do we need the permits? And we asked the public, do you think, you know, we need the permits? And we actually did. We did sell out during the pandemic, you know. And and, and the public clearly said yes. What? Why would you get rid of this? You know, um, this is a this is we're trying to, you know, control like, you know, look at look at recreation. Why why would we take something away? And if you take something away like that, it's going to be hard to reinstate. Right. So I'm just curious about like, um, I mean, I mean there'd be two purposes or potentially a couple of purposes for the for the for the permitting. Number one, of course, would be kind of like a quota system, making sure that it's not being overused or overfished. The other though is like a source of Revenue, perhaps, it is a is the extra fee and permit system a source of revenue that somehow does something for the permit fee amount was set up originally by not not Price Reservoir was not open for the right. it was just a stream of public work. When it opened in the early nineteen nineties, not Price Reservoir to fishing. There were two concerns. One is, let me just get in the boat. It's been closed for 30 years. There's monster fishing. <laughs> so turns out there wasn't, but that's okay. Uh, uh, so there's a concern it would be too much pressure to many people. Yeah. And then, um, so a fishing permit fee was set to cover the cost of administering the permit fee. Okay. So really, yes, we do get some money. Basically, that's what it costs us to check the licenses and run the program. And it, it really isn't an option check. When we have, we still have a cap on licenses. Mm -hmm. 600. We originally were at 500, we always sold out 500. So we moved it to 600. And then for years, a number of years, we didn't sell all 600. We did during the pandemic pressure because you couldn't go anywhere else to fish. <laughs> and everywhere else is closed. Um, now, lately, if we sell out, I think it's going to make the season. 2021, we came very, very close. And then it hasn't been as close. In, it wasn't as close in 2022. I think we, anecdotally, or off the top of my head, I would say high 400s uh, in 2022, 2021. Um, pretty close to selling out um, and uh, we switched over to online sales uh, which reduced the ranger staff time involved in, in administering the, the at least the sale of permits we're very strict about checking permits both state licenses and city permits um, and as the pandemic eased we switched back over where we have online sales we also do in-person sales and phone sales um, which is helpful for people who don't have access to to the internet uh, or is not current as familiar with how to access the city's recreation website. We considered in the late 1990s, uh, early 2000s, to eliminate the permit system and just lock it. Let them go Did a lot of outreach, got the exact same result. Now we want you to keep selling permits and keep it fixed. Well, I mean, from a fishing perspective, we probably don't want to be out there elbow to elbow with a thousand people either so like making sure that you know if you're able to get one of the permits of course then then you know that it'll be not as busy as perhaps uh, other places you know just a curiosity for you do we allow boats okay not contact with water technically <laughs> some people now we do allow 
people who are fishing just being in the water in the stream waiting specifically Wait. is for the purpose of fishing the code yeah. you can't yeah. go out and fish all the time i can't i don't know but i know it's not very particular about that if there's anything uh, i would see it's like it's definitely the most strictly enforced from a ranger statistic perspective it's the most strictly enforced regulation is is the prohibition on swimming and water contact as well as prohibition on boating the one exemption in the or exception in in the municipal code is we do permit uh if, if someone were to kayak down the north st marine from Elon's park uh to continue uh, in a continuous downstream fashion through the reservoir, which I understand was more popular prior to the 2013 flood. It's extremely, and it's professional level and beyond difficulty, whitewater upstream of the reservoir. So I've, I, I've been working as a ranger for the city since 2020. I've yet to see anybody kayak down the North St. Brain, and I'm friends with some high level whitewater folks, and it seems that it's just not very popular anymore, but we do allow for that. Um, so people can portage the dams and continue downstream. They can't put on the water in the reservoir, uh, except for at our trailhead and continue downstream for the parking lot. So essentially no boating is allowed upstream. Awesome, you have any comments? I was curious, um, the other boards that said they would apply to my decision in terms of recommendations. Yeah, can you do that? Can you please see that again? <laughs> uh, just curious as to the one, the sunset one. Our sustainability board, the person who dissented did not make any comments, so I'm not sure who to make any comments. Um, the person who dissented on Parks and Recreation board did make some comments. Um, and he's he's said that he's heard a lot from public talking to him and saying that you know it would be a tragedy to not allow dogs on Button Rock, um, and they love having their dogs there, and they don't want that taken away. So he was really trying to be an advocate for those voices. And then two other of the um, folks felt the same way. Um, the three that were split, so there were two people in Parks and Rec Advisory Board that were kind of in that, trying to play the, you know, advocate role for saying that we've heard a lot from the public saying they want their dogs there and they don't want anything to change. Um, to, and then the third person said he has two dogs, um, and but he understands looking at the rules and regulations and the present day circumstances and that the interim rule made sense to him and what he did was he just adapted. But when it came to uh, putting together the language for their vote, um, they wanted to have that piece in there and when it, about the dog, and when it came to that part, he voted with um, the two that were bringing up the, the public wanting dogs there. Did that make sense? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> How did that vote work then? So they they accepted the plan, but part of the plan is to have a moratorium on dogs. So 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 they carved out that piece of the plan and they voted on it separately. Three of them did. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, six of them did because theoretically it was three, two, three. I guess. Or right. it was it, there was some. Well, there was a lot of like talk about how does this thing. work. Yeah. Okay. And um, you know they had a they had a difficult time wording their their vote, and so you know if if I didn't give a good detailed summary, of course the recording is available and you can watch them. They're on they were on the thirteenth um, have their have their discussion. And if I could maybe characterize it, I hope to characterize it well. They had an earlier vote about the dog, and that's where I'm not to. Three wanted to preserve the pivot moments, two wanted to not. So we, we couldn't come up with a recommendation in that aspect. Then they considered the whole thing. And obviously, two of them who had voted as they did felt, even though maybe they didn't 
to the reformation of that particular part of the overall reformed reform. With the dog restriction. With the dog restriction, yes. 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 As a recommendation. I mean, I, you know, it's not unusual, I would think. I mean, their, their purview, of course, is a, kind of a recreational purview, right? And dogs, presumably, are a, a, a part of that. Well, they right? even debated that, actually. Okay, interesting. And, yeah. and not all of them felt that way. Okay. So. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, yeah, presumably, three of them made some assessment that, that, uh, that, that dogs maybe weren't part of that equation. I, I think it's interesting with the sustainability group voted a little bit, a, a bit more uh, in, in favor without the kind of dog stipulation. I think Water Board has a kind of similar um, purview, let's say, it's sustainability. I mean, of course, we have a different focus, but it, of course, it's a more environmentally and, and kind of um, and uh, resources uh, focus area rather than that kind of, you know. Marcia, you guys have Yeah, um, just to get back to Alice's question, um, Heather, you may know whether it was this person or not. There was one person on the Sustainability Advisory Board who opposes all regulation. Oh, was it? Uh, was was that, that person? Huh, interesting. You know, I'll just tell you my preference. Rather than us sit here and debate dog or no dog, I, I would prefer either you approve the plan or you do not approve the plan. Just keep it clean. If, you, if this dog issue is a big issue with you, you don't approve the plan. That that would be my preference when we go to vote on this. So I'm just telling you, uh, I don't want to get into a big dog debate. <laughs> and, and I don't care if you like dogs or don't like dogs. You yeah. like the plan or don't you? So. Any other comments? I do have one more question, actually. So. Um, so I, I thought it that in the in there was a line I, I thought and I was just searching for it here in the plan something about that there had been an increase in for example E. coli or some markers of what could be a, a, a kind of uh, attached to kind of dog and uh, activity perhaps um, in in the watershed or did that show up yet do you recall if that shows up in any of the it's not something that's sampled for. The reservoir is, um, to bake, it's not something that's that's looked at in particular like that. So there's no direct link. There's nothing in this that says E. coli has increased, so we need to prohibit dogs. There's no nothing at all like that. But the question was asked by the public, and you might have seen it in a public comment and response, either on the website or in the comments in the appendices. Yeah. Um, yeah. Dog feces cause E. coli any more than a hair it, it, it has happened in the Jefferson County um, watershed where it's been shut down because of E. coli. Yeah. And I did read that in newspaper articles and things about this process, but you know, my memory is it's been a couple of years, but that, that is something that occurred and it was because of the E. coli and it I From but but it, that study was not done. That's not part of the data of this plan. This, that has nothing to do with our plan, our watershed, the results that we're presenting here. So I'm not to be confused. That was a newspaper article that I read. I did not, it's not included in this plan. Yeah, I mean, I think in general, like ruminants and things that don't, for example, you know, herbivores and things that just have just generally lower kind of uh, all pathogen counts within their guts and feces, et cetera. Dogs, of course, eat, you know, there are, it there depends are on exactly what they eat, you know, dog, but ultimately dog they're, they're more omnivorous, the you, can, yes. you can think of them as, and yeah, so they do want to. Because I, I do know that, you know, but, wildlife feces can cause a giardian soap. Yeah. You drink yeah. Stream, wa stream water, no matter how clear it is. I didn't know if, like, dog feces could really cause you to have to know that. Okay. Daniel, thank you for your presentation. Um, I guess I will ask, is there a motion from anybody to accept this point? Is there a second? Okay. Move and second. Uh, yes, yeah, you can make a comment. Thank you. And maybe the motion I'd like to explain kind of why I'm using it. Um, so 
from my perspective, um, I, I think that healthy water trends can use my reverse. I, I don't know about the feces in the water, but I do think that there is fluid in the hose just kind of dry bumps and dogs and animals that's just natural processes. So I would support all the recommendations for that reason and respect your recommendation as well because you guys are professionals to do this on a daily basis. So thank you very much for all the work that goes into it and the amazing pictures as always. <laughs> okay. A motion being made and second. Uh, I missed it, I'm sorry. I heard getting a second. The motion and a second? Okay. Motion uh, and second by right. Kevin. Uh, no, the remaining. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So, let's go. All in favor? Aye. Aye. No opposed. Aye. So we don't know who likes dogs or not, but we're moving forward. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I get the message. Right? I think it's very important, but we do what we can up here. So thanks again for your work on this and your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Heather, are you doing a... Yeah. Um, just real quickly, there were a few bills that are sort of water related um, listed in your packet. We really haven't been tracking uh, water le legislative bills much this year. There really isn't much like normal. Um, the, the, the standard CWCB projects bill is in there and uh, Long other than having projects on it, so um, uh, most of them are passing away. <laughs> I would recommend. So we don't have any bills that are asking for that convention. Just to keep with that. Um, actually, from a lot of folks, that would be a pretty quiet session this year. That's good. It's good. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's all we got. Okay, Wes. Monthly water supply update. So, um, for that time of year, we we'll probably pay a slight bit closer attention to what's going on. So, we included in the packet of some different stuff. Um, first thing we've included is the Colorado Water Supply Outlook report that comes out each at the beginning of each month. And uh, so, it'll be updating that. Actually, here probably within about a week. But um, so we included that. But what we really look at at that um, primarily is Colorado headwaters and the uh, South Platte Basin. And so at the very end of that, I've included um, a couple graphs. First being the uh, the one for the Colorado headwaters, and as of today. Snow water equivalent was at about 121%. And so we, today we were at about a little over 15 inches of snow water. And the peak is usually about 16 inches. And that peak is normally hit on April on April 7th. So we're, um, we're, we're pretty good. We're in good shape uh, for that Colorado. And then for the South Platte, we're, um, Likewise, in pretty good shape, maybe not quite as good relative to the Colorado uh, headwaters. Today we were at 107% on the South Platte. And so that, that was representing about 11 inches with the peak at about 15 inches that we find on the 26th of April. So usually we hit the peak earlier on the Colorado River than we do the South Platte Basin but uh, both of which are above normal. And then lastly, um, I think I included one for the St. Rain Basin. And um, for the St. Rain Basin, uh, keep in mind that really reflects like one snow tail site. Uh, I'm kind of on page 36 on your particular example. But, um, but the, um, the St. Rain Basin today was in a, 121% of average, but we're actually higher today than we would have normally found ourselves at the peak. So what we'd like to see is see that peak grow or sustain as time moves on, so then that means we're going to get, have a better runoff. And so we'll, get, we'll keep monitoring that. 
Well, and then the last thing we've included was the U.S. Drought Monitor for Colorado. And I guess what I wanted to, I guess the following page, and, and what I wanted to kind of highlight there was, when we look at last year, um, a year ago on this date, um, 100% of the state was in an abnormally dry condition or worse. This year, um, a little over 50% was in that abnormally dry or worse condition. And just about 45% had snow drought. So the, the general message is we're much better this year than we were last year, which we're all thankful. So, definitely a lot less colorful. Yeah, yeah. which is you right, and that's what we like to see on this map. So, um, so that's kind of where we're at. And that was the only additional thing I wanted to uh, bring to your attention as we get into Kevin's already mentioned to the water supply status report. Yeah, it's favorable. Yeah, no question about it. We're in good shape, but we, we really are, as always, looking for those spring storms, those are what help us with that peak runoff, which is going to be really important to have for storage. Any questions? All right. Thank you. Jason. So for engineering updates, um, we're wrapping up. Uh, the, one, the one big one I wanted to bring up to you is we're wrapping up that uh, uh, the Upper North St. Green Pipeline uh, alignment study. Um, we had actually tried to schedule Blueberry to come in and give you a presentation today, but we didn't want to cut short uh, Daniel's presentation time, and uh, we want a little bit more time to study and prepare our slides. So we're going to try to uh, bring that to you at, at uh, next month's uh, meeting. Mm -hmm. So we'll have Dewberry come, we'll have uh, Schnabel uh, come as well, and so there's Dew for coming, but she did give you a great presentation, and any uh, questions you have and stuff, we'll have uh, our consultants and staff on board to answer those questions. Right. But, uh, we wanted to kind of run that through you guys first before we uh, show that to uh, city literature. All right. That's the one big update. That's, that's it. Okay. That's it. That's it. Yeah. All right. Um, can you want to talk about that? Yeah, we're still, uh, projects still moving forward, uh, even though we, this was pretty cold weather <laughs> this winter. There were a number of weather days but by and large, because they're, they're in, I'll call it the rock <laughs> quarry portion of the project, um, they kept the rock quarry going. That, that's one of the real big uh, time sensitive issues is basically creating rock. So the rock fell down. And of course, the outlet tunnel, the end tunnel, continued on, and they're, they're, they're working for both sides of it. Both portals now, so uh, that is going well. Um, the other part of the project is the Colorado River Connectivity Channel, and the West Slope. And of course, that because you're up at Granby Elevation, that, uh, that has shut down for the winter. They're hoping to get um, going in March, towards the end of March, and then kind of up there. A little more low snow up there. Than um, normal, so it might be a, might delay a lot, maybe a week or so, but they're still still planning on getting back into construction. We've actually, as of last fall, they had turned the dam, and um, remember they're going to take half of the reservoir out, turn turn the main dam, create it, build a new dam, and pour the Colorado River in the West Slope. And that dam is up and is. Up high enough to be make so it would be safe. So spring runoff. They would like to get it about one to two foot higher before the spring runoff, so that's why they're anxiously waiting to get back in and start working. But um, yeah, basically waiting for waiting for a thaw on the west slope. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to do was was play show and tell today. <laughs> so um, I've got um, I don't know if you call it a heavyweight coaster or, or uh, dangerous to me. Wheel, uh, paperweight or whatever. Um, this is actually um, the core um, from the hydraulic asphalt core of the dam. Um, 
the first placement was in October. And um, they, it was about 40 foot tall. Continue on from there. Um, I wanted to let you see. Um, I always try myself to say hydraulic asphalt core rather than just asphalt core, because when you say asphalt core, people think of a street and brushed up the track. And, right? This is this is uh, the typical asphalt from a street. Actually, from a lot of the street. Um, if you look at that core, and then this is the actual asphalt core from the dam. If you look. And the hydraulic asphalt is about twice the content of asphalt that a regular you know, the asphalt that you would have on the street. So you can just but visually, it's also smaller grain. Um, and uh, nice the reason that additional uh, asphalt is made it more viable and uh, really self healing um, when you get the weight of the dam on top of it, all the minerals on top of it. Even if, say, it were an earthquake or something, it would um, have potentially self healing. Also, it makes a much better water stop. And of course, being in the, in the dam, it's not as <laughs> heavy, yeah. So, anyway, just wanted to let you see what the uh, actual hydraulic asphalt is. And you know, that solidifies pretty significantly. I thought of asphalt, damn, I thought, you know. Is that really going to go? Switchy, yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah no, Quite solid, so. Yeah, so anyway, um, right now we're going to go on. So they, it sounds like they had backed off to get the winter behind them or the weather behind them. Or on the west. Yeah. Slow, yeah. And then here on this side, they've been working the other way. And they've been working the other side. It must be what civil engineers do if they take away the style of uh, dam cores. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I, have a I have a bunch of old uh, dam cores that, that have been made into um, a book, um, bookends. Bookends. There yeah. you go. Yeah. Uh -huh. Because uh, my dad said that well, when they get bored in the, in the, in the, in the mill, that that's what they do. So. <laughs> Okay. That is true. You, well, you know, you, you, yeah, you just know. Like, oh, no. it's, 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 like, it's your creative yeah. outlet, I guess. So. I know. Jeremy Bollard was really a source of chopsticks. I mean, you know, we, we got all kinds of toys. We got the shovel and the uh, the groundbreaking golden shovel, uh -huh. and the uh -huh. little jar of rock, <laughs> all kinds of stuff. Well, here's a nice mug. Are you having these in the bowl? Yeah. Stuff? Yeah. All right. Uh, water rights filing update. Just wanted to update the Water Board on two water rights filings. Um, you may recall in uh, December of 2021, we came to the Water Board uh, for a recommendation to file a new water right on the same Green Creek, uh, basically straight north of here. Uh, that was what I'm going to call the same Green Creek filing, uh, 20 CFS filing. Um, it, was really partially in conjunction with the change case on the bonus stitch, but it also gives us uh, downstream water uh, to meet downstream obligations and it included a, a water right uh, to put water in a St. Lake Creek pump station to help the Union Reservoir. So, kind of a downstream water right. Um, we filed that in December of 21. We had um, four statements of opposition. Just settled um, with the last opposer, so that case now um, we'll be putting together the uh, final decree to submit the water court and we should, uh, no opposition, we should have a um, final decree in the next couple, two to three months. Um, so we're happy with that. <laughs> that was successful. Um, the other water right was a change of the bonus ditch, the bonus ditch to birds out. Just east of Main Street on the St. Green Creek. Goes out of General Irrigates property east of Longmont, east of Costco. Actually, irrigated the property Costco is on now. Goes all the way out to Sandstone Ranch and irrigates some city open space out there. It's also going to general open space. We own 56% of that company. Um, primarily, um, the, the water goes out of Costco property. Um, 
we took that in the water court, filed that case in 2020. Got a number of opposers. Um, one of huge note to us was Aurora. First time we ever had an opposition from the city of Aurora. Um, but uh, we've now essentially settled with everybody. We don't actually have a statement of opposition signed with, with the ditch company itself. We're doing an operations agreement um, that's done. We've indicated everything's fine, but the president of the company's President, who was a Boulder County employee, retired and, and had to take two months off, and then we'll be back for another two months. So he's the president of the company. So when he gets back, which is in March, um, we'll sign the final documents on that and have that uh, change case uh, ready to uh, submit for our final approvals there. So we're happy. Uh, two, two major cases we're uh, moving forward. So. Good news. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there we go. All right. Uh, anything you want to talk about the major project listing at all? Or? Um, I don't have all my last cover if there's anything more. So I just, all I wanted to mention, um, we, you know, we continue to track some of those things. We did talk today about the water supply, or the, uh, I'm sorry, the upcoming in April, we'll be bringing the water supply drop management plan and then uh, next month, the uh, cash and review. Um, but on the other topics, um, one of the questions was asked last year about remaining historic water rights and water rights uh, deficits within the LTA. And so we kind of worked with our GIS folks, and I just wanted to give you a, just a real high level um, uh, report on that. Um, so, roughly speaking, there's about 4,000 acre feet of outstanding uh, raw water deficits within the LTA. And of that, about half would be satisfied through the transfer of uh, historic water rights. And so the remainder would be non-historic. And of that, roughly 2,000-ish acre feet. Um, we're estimating somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 would be realistically expected to be satisfied with that. Of the, of the 2,000 acre feet that would be deemed to be satisfied as either non historic or cash and old, we're, we're anticipating half to three quarters of that would be um, satisfied vis a vis cash and old. So, just want to get back to answering your questions if you guys had on that. Okay. Um, any other comments? So yeah, LPA. If I said LPA, we were both thinking about. Would be the other one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Or you maybe wanted to go out to lunch and have a glass of water. You know, I had uh, I was looking at the status report, the Union Reservoir and Land Enlargement Acquisition Program. We approved it. Uh, assuming council did too. Uh, is that, is that kind of moving along or is it a stance or what's going on there? Um, th that's, that's a, uh, <clears throat> so, so 25 years ago, we approved acquire the property around Union Reservoir. Um, once a year or so, we just bring an update to water board. Um, most recently, we, we, our last update was when we purchased the parcel property on the West side of the reservoir, on the Kelhar Estate. Uh, there is one more parcel on the west side that we need to acquire that we're currently negotiating with, and we believe we'll have that information probably in March or April, probably closer yeah. to April. Uh, I guess we'll update the board. Okay. We'll go ahead and that parcel. Assuming that that parcel is acquired, um, the it, the work for the expansion is not funded on the comprehensive plan, is it? It is not. No. What is the comprehensive plan, Marshall? It's me. 
<laughs> you're, our, you're the source, Marcia. Well, they haven't brought up a new one yet for quite a while. It's, so I think it's, yeah, it's, they're 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 supposed to be um, working on some revisions to envision, and um, it's uh, uh, there's so many uh, land use zoning conflicts that what they're looking at is is to like have bifurcate the code so essentially there's one set of land use and building codes for the um, old suburban style zoning and one set of land use and building codes for the urban rules and so I'm not sure what's going to happen with that I bet it's going to be exciting actually because um, there are a lot of people who don't want the rules to change yeah. Very good. Okay, I guess there's nothing item 11, no informational item. No, there's no need for that. Okay. Um, cash in lieu, we're looking at that next month, right? Okay. Uh, you know, part of our packet, maybe we can talk to you about it. I don't know what you want to say, but a copy of the letter to the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation on. That was an email that was sent out. So if you sent that information at the time, that's just the informational items that were attached in the packet. Okay. So, you know, it appears that this whole issue has just kind of continued to be in a state of flux on how we're going to resolve all this. Yeah, very much so. Yes. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of national politics going on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can yeah. Know. Does the, does the consideration of does the do the national politics and this kind of national discussion about the broader Kent Western issue, especially around Colorado River, that impacts us solely through uh, through our investment in in the CP and then also the maybe down to the Forest River and even down to Killing Moon. Um, are there any other, there, there's really no other linkages really between us and, and that broader discussion? Yeah, there wouldn't be in terms of our natives. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Cedar Creek would be huge. And any any kind of deficits or or adjustments that have to be made to the operation of CDP does that do you feel like that's going to get would get spread evenly amongst the stakeholders or, or do do we somehow have priority because we got in so early or what are the stipulations in like our kind of association with that project? Well, the CBT water is pretty well allocated. So. Or units that we own. So, yeah. Uh, if there were, maybe not, you know, if it reduces the amount of water in storage, then our allocation. Uh, and, and that, that that's a, I mean, there's a formal process in place for that. It, it just means that each share is worth a, a lesser amount of acres, but which is already every year they adjust that, that number. And so, we already have a process in place for that, and so theoretically, it's just perennially we would be allocated less water for every share, for every share, such that we are in kind of like dry or drought years today. But it just it's that that's the new norm if that were to become a thing later or, or kind of moving forward. Yeah, chances are, the first things that would happen is, I would suspect. The carryover program would be eliminated. Um, and certainly, there would be no regional pool. So, the water that's in the system would, would start trickling down strictly to be used on a year over year basis to cure all the losses. That would probably would be enough. Um, but understanding that you know, future climate and future yield yeah. are very I know. Um, again, I've, I've said for years, 
Colorado is well behind, or is well below its oil at that point. What would have to happen, essentially, before it would impact us would be a major shift in the law of the river. Yeah. Lower basin over overuses, way overuses, gets a lot more of the river. And the upper basin really enters. Yeah, there's a lot of politics there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you, I mean, that's, that's, but, you know. Yeah, true. So, assuming we go to war with California. Yeah. Um, <laughs> seriously. So, what, uh, I'm probably the only person here who doesn't know this, but percentage of Longmont's usage, there's CBT water versus there's, you know, our native basin water. Where, where, how's that breakdown? So our, our, all of our water rights planning mm -hmm. and uh, our, our uh, guiding water principles and everything we kind of set up, um, our plan is for two thirds native basin water and one third um, trans basin water. I think that's a good, it's a good mix. It, it diversifies our portfolio. Um, it allow, pressures us to make sure we use our native basin water first. You know, um, uh, we've actually used, it, our actual use is probably closer to half and half, maybe even a tiny bit more west slope just because we have excess supplies of both. And so um, it's a tiny bit easier to use the west slope water of our treatment plants. So um, because of that, Use has been a little bit more trans basin. But um, long term, if all of this you know, uh, becomes an issue, only one third of our water, of the future water supply, would be impacted. In terms of, right, if it stops raining on the eastern slope, we're still screwed. Then, yes. Uh, climate, that, that part of it is. Uh, well, um, it is um, our, our, certainly our junior water rights, Button Rock, storage, some of those get more impacted. Our senior water rights, well, because the first and time first and right, our senior water rights won't be affected. Our junior water rights will get called out completely. Mm -hmm. so, um, any, uh, any other comments on agendas? Going forward, or, yes. I have a request for a presentation um, for Longmont, or sorry, City of Raymond for Northern Conservancy District. It's doing a little stuff on PL566 and yes. then some big strides. I was just hoping you might take a moment. Um, yes, excellent point. I'll, I'll uh, ask Charlie if you can have uh, you, you yeah. um, City of yeah. Raymond, Left Hand Water Conservancy District is the watershed group yeah. for this area. Please don't know. Um, PL, PL566 yeah. is a law that enables people to be able to drink the water. Right. Yeah. It's, it's through the SOCA Natural Resources Conservation yeah. Service. Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. Yeah. The district's I, I, I just one question. I don't know if this leads to a presentation or if it's just for our own kind of education at the moment. But uh, the the projections that so I I mean there's a lot of work that's done in Colorado Basin in, in terms of projections of impacts of climate in terms of climate, etc. What do we use as our kind of base resource for projections on the east slope for changes? in hydrology due to future climate change? So um, it's actually been a little while ago, but um, a while back, all of the Flint Range municipalities went together uh, with um, the American Water Works Association Research Foundation um, and did what we call the Flint Range Climate Change Vulnerability Study. And that study, and we use the biggest names in the Climate industry. Uh, Brad Udall, from, yeah, I was going to just say. Um, Collins, Foster, yeah. 
PCU, CU is um, and a number, I mean, a number of others have prepared a report um, to look at the future plan and what we are looking at. We then use those numbers as input to our own uh, future water demand evaluation, and then um, out of that, we came up with, um, we looked at how that would impact water rights in the St. Bain Basin, and um, which water rights and how much, how far down the tree that hurts us, and that's how we came up with a number. We have a number uh, for future water impact or, or the future water availability based upon climate change. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, so, so does that include then future water supply? Is, so, so in other words, so you said future water demand, but included in this assessment then is how much supply is actually in Yeah, it, it looked at both what's a hotter, drier climate it, it increase so we look at the increase in, in usage of the land, okay. and then how does it impact our you know, lower supply? Yeah. How does it impact our supply? We look at how it would impact different water rights and how much, and so it's really, you, you increase the demand a little bit, you decrease supply a little bit, and that's the, that's the impact. Yeah. And we, we model that as a demand, you know, as a, a variability, oh, we call yeah. them. Uh, future water demand variabilities. And so that's a count that. Is that publicly available? Yep, it's on our website. Yeah. I'd be happy to um, come back sometime with a presentation on that. And I, I guess refresh. that feeds into this discussion. It was just, you know, at some point, it looks like we had a little time. So I'm kind of interested to see. Yeah, I would be happy to do that. It's not necessarily a priority. One question before we close that I've got. Do we, I was looking over some information on a water board annual report. Do we do that annually? Is, yeah. Are you working on it? It'll, it's, yeah, it'll, it'll be coming to you next month. Okay. So yeah, that's one of the things you, one of your charges, one of your requirements <laughs> is to produce that to the local okay. city council. All right. All right. Okay. Is there a motion to adjourn? So many. All right, all in favor? Aye. All right, we're adjourned. Aye.